My name is Stephanie, and I'm a product manager on the Microsoft Edge Developer Experiences team. Um, and today, I'm going to be talking about some exciting new web technology for building layouts for the web um, for dual screen devices. So I've been involved with this work stream um, at Microsoft for about a year and a half. And I've gotten to watch these APIs evolve from their initial state to uh, the state that they're in now. Um, and They've become these very ergonomic and easy to use APIs um, that leverage existing concepts on the web instead of completely new APIs. So learning about them and using them are much more, in my opinion, seamless than in their initial state. Um, and I think that's what I'm most excited about sharing with you today is how seamless these things are to um, start integrating into your code uh, to progressively enhance your website or your progressive web app uh, for a dual screen device and deliver an experience that delights users on those devices. Uh, so today, we're going to go over some multi-screen device history, uh, the evolution of responsive web design. We'll look at the new CSS media features, uh, some new CSS environment variables for layout. We'll look at the JavaScript API, which is the Visual Viewport API, a couple examples, some best practices, and then how you can test and build dual screen layouts even if you don't have um, a physical device. So the concept of foldable devices uh, has been around since about 2004, from what I could find on the internet. Uh, so this is a few years before single screen smartphones took hold. And in 2004, we saw the first dual screen device. It was a touch screen concept from a firm called V12. Uh, and it was a dual screen touch screen laptop. And then in 2006, we saw our first foldable that rolled up. It was called a Redius. It was a concept that was a little bit more out there, and it like literally folded, rolled up. And then by 2008, Nokia was even showing a trifold flexible device uh, that was multifunctional. So it could be a large screen device uh, when it was completely unfolded, and then when you folded it down, uh, it would become phone-sized, and then eventually it could become a smart wristband, so a concept that was really multifunctional. Um, but, and after these devices came actually many more concepts and prototypes. So if we look at the timeline here, uh, we had prototypes and concepts for dual screens and foldables uh, being shown up um, until 2019 when devices were actually announced and started hitting the market for consumers. So the concept of foldable and multi-screen devices isn't necessarily new. It's been in development for well over a decade. And the current market for foldables is still growing. So in 2021, there, was a to there were total shipments of uh, foldable devices uh, up to 7.1 million devices, up from 1.9 million in 2020. Um, and as of right now, that's currently projected to reach 27.6 million units in 2025. Now, in the grand scheme of things, like that's not a huge share of the phone market, but it's still millions of devices that are out there. Um, and companies are now into their second and third generation of devices uh, building these devices, so they're, they're not going anywhere uh, based on this data. So we should really start thinking about, or at least be aware of, the technology that's available to design for these devices um, as their numbers start to increase out in the market. And I want to go back to 2002 for a moment because we really can't talk about designing for dual screen devices without talking about responsive design. Um, and this concept has been around for a lot longer than I think folks may realize. So in 2022, or sorry, 20, 2002, a team at Razorfish uh, in Germany was working on a redesign of the Audi website. And the team had used JavaScript to identify a user's viewport and it would serve up one of the one of three sizes dynamically, depending on whatever viewport size was in front of the user. 
And though this isn't perhaps like quite the same as what we'd call a responsive website today, like the fundamental idea of a site layout adapting to fit what the user had is still there. Now, Jim Callback is one of the project members, and he talks about building this site in a brief post on his website. And he mentions the idea of flexible layouts for the web and how he was already thinking about different screen size possibilities at the time because there were things like e-readers and something called web TV. He was already thinking about um, how we could scale. And so this was 2002. Uh, it was five years before the iPhone. But he was already like, thinking about new possible devices and how to adapt. And then in 2010, three years after the first iPhone was released, uh, the concept of responsive design as we know it today was formalized by Ethan Marcotte in A List Apart. And Ethan said, now more than ever, we're designing work meant to be viewed along a gradient of different experiences. Responsive web design offers us a way forward, finally allowing us to design for the ebb and flow of things. And in rereading his article today, like I still found so much of it still applicable uh, to building and designing for the web. Uh, Ethan formalized this concept of design being fluid, uh, not designing for specific devices. And the dual screen uh, platform primitives that I'm going to talk about today really embrace that spirit of not designing for a specific device, even though we have this entirely new device class. And if you look at what you can do today with web tech across so many different devices and platforms, it's quite frankly amazing. Like You can build a single app, and it can run on multiple platforms, and it will respond to different screen sizes, resolution, orientation. Like You can even, allow it, you can even target old and new technology so that users get the best experience they can for their device. And so we're already doing these things for so many different devices already. And today, I would really want you to come away from this talk with the idea that dual screens um, they are just the next evolution in responsive design and progressive enhancement. They're not this massive new obstacle to start thinking about. Like, I don't want you to fear the hinge or the fold, and, and I want you to embrace it. Um, and I want you to be excited to utilize this web technology and start experimenting with it um, and using this new code, because there's devices on the market today, and it's quite frankly, amazing what you can do with, with this code. And so on the Microsoft Edge team, um, we really wanted to make sure we could empower developers to do just that and take advantage of dual screen devices um, and enable them to deliver those enhanced experiences. So our web platform team worked incredibly hard and in conjunction with community groups to deliver two new APIs initially um, for web layout. Um, and these were nearly impossible when Microsoft announced its Surface Duo and when the Samsung Galaxy Fold hit the market. So the team had designed, proposed, and implemented a CSS screen spanning media feature and an entirely new uh, JavaScript API called Windows Segments Enumeration. And this was to make those dual screen enhanced layouts possible. Now, we initially put these APIs into origin trials for developers uh, to use and test before they were shipped in the browser because we wanted to make sure we got this right and developers would be happy to use these things. Um, and if you don't know what an origin trial is, um, we asked for feedback sort of in exchange for trying out experimental uh, features. And we actually ended up modifying the design of both APIs, um, and we merged them with an already existing concept um, in standards bodies, which is the viewport. So the new proposals are a viewport segments media feature. And for the JavaScript API, we're now just a segments property that hangs off the visual viewport API. And then we even ended up making some changes to our CSS environment variables that were initially proposed based on that feedback, again, from the web development community. And so the team really wanted these new capabilities to be easy to work with. So when they were designing these APIs, um, they focused on simplicity and ergonomics. 
Like we want you to spend more time thinking outside the box um, and coding your dual screen device instead of trying to learn an entirely new concept and figuring out how these new APIs like fit into your existing architecture. So let's dive into the CSS viewport segments media feature, which I'm a CSS girl, so this is what I'm personally most excited about. Um, so dual screens, again, are, are just the next step in responsive design. So it, another responsive design target. So just as you use your media queries and features in your CSS today to detect and serve up styles that are specific to your phones or your tablets or your desktops, um, you can use a media feature to detect this new class of device um, using these viewport segments media features. And now the viewport uh, segments media feature, it can have two values. One is the horizontal viewport segment, and then you provide an integer. And this represents the state of the device when the device hinge is vertical, and the viewports are split by this hinge, or they fold into two columns, so like a book. And then the second one is, oops. The second one is vertical viewport segments. And this is the state of the device where the fold is horizontal and the two viewports are stacked on top of each other and split into rows. So we'll look at a very basic example here, uh, and then I'll show a more in-depth one in a little bit uh, when I go through some design examples. But in this example here, we're combining our horizontal viewport segments media feature with another media query, uh, min width. So we're saying if the device has two viewport segments that are side by side, uh, and the viewport has a minimum width of 540 pixels, make the background of the body element yellow. Um, so if we run that on three different devices, this will only target the dual screen device. Now, some of our Customers also wanted to be able to uh, snap their content to the fold of the device, which makes sense. Um, because on some of the devices, we do have this physical hinge that actually obscures um, the content uh, in the browser if you're spanning across both viewports. Um, and so obviously, folks wanted to avoid that hinge. Like You want to place content within the display region boundaries. Um, so with our current media feature solution that we just looked at, we, we can detect if the browser is spanning across two displays um, on a dual screen, but that's not enough to achieve this um, at the moment. You could probably go on to assume that both screens are the same size, but that doesn't really necessarily scale um, on, on new foldables. And so we don't want to assume that both screens are equal size. So let's look at the proposed solution for identifying those different viewports. So on top of the media features, um, the team also introduced a set of environment variables that help with identifying the sizing of the viewport segments. And they also help with positioning and placement of elements within the viewport. Um, and so we have six new variables to help with this. Uh, the viewport segment environment variables have two dimensions which represent the X and Y position, respectively, in the two-dimensional grid that's created by the hardware uh, features that are separating the segments. And so segments along the left edge have an X position of zero, and then those in the next column or viewport to the right have an X position of one, and then segments along the top edge have a Y position of zero, et cetera. So essentially, there is a rectangle for each segment, uh, which is represented by the six values we have. So we have top, right, bottom, left, width, and height. Um, now, viewport segment width and height, those are basically convenience properties because you could calculate the display width or height uh, with viewport segment right and viewport segment left, but that becomes very verbose uh, when you're trying to calculate that. And so we'll look at some very simple um, examples of how to use these variables with just a couple boxes. Um, so for our example here, we have four boxes, and they are wrapped in a flex container uh, with a flex, flex direction of row. And so for box one, 
We have our width and our height set to 100 pixels, and we're going to set our position to absolute. And then we're going to position with the left property, and we're going to use the calc function to subtract 100 pixels from the right viewport segment of the left display to get that aligned along the fold. And then for box two, uh, again, set our height. Um, and we're going to use the viewport segment width variable with indices 1, 0 um, to define our width of that box. So we want it to take up the entire right-hand viewport. Um, and then we're going to set our positioning to absolute, saying we want it to start at the edge of the left segment of this display, and we want it pinned to the top. So the top is then set to 0. And then box three, again, set our height. Um, and then again, we're going to use that viewport segment width variable with indices 0, 0 to set our, box, our box's width to take up, again, that whole first viewport. Um, and for this example, we're also going to include another value there, or we're going to say 100% as a fallback if for some reason our environment variable indices don't work. Uh, so you can include a fallback width that is optional. Um, and then we don't need any variables for our left or um, top positioning, just zero uh, for the bottom. And then finally, box four, again, set our height, set our width, position absolute. And then we want to pin to the left segment of the right display. So we're going to use viewport segment left, indices one, zero, and the bottom set to zero. So hopefully that gives like a general idea of how you use those um, environment variables. And we'll look at a real app example uh, in a little bit with some more code. But let's talk about our second uh, web feature, which is the JavaScript API um, that we ended up folding into the Visual Viewport API. Now, the concept of the viewport is already something developers are familiar with. And again, in the interest of making these uh, new concepts easy to integrate with your existing architecture, uh, the team thought it made more sense to add this into the existing Visual Viewport API specification. Now, today, when you are on a desktop computer and you query visualviewport.segments, uh, this will return null if there is only one viewport segment. And then on a dual screen device, however, uh, you will get two DOM recs that represent the two viewports uh, that are available when the browser window is spanning across fold. Now, the value that we have stored in the segments constant is an immutable snapshot of the device state uh, at the time the attribute was queried which means once you resize the browser window or you rotate the device, uh, the viewport segments that were previously retrieved are no longer valid. So you need to query this attribute again in either a resize event or an orientation change event. And so you can see when we change the viewport from spanning across two display regions to only one display region, we'll, re uh, we'll fire that resize event for you. And if you rotate the device, that will fire both the resize and orientation change event. Um, and you can use these events to query that attribute again and see what the current state of the browser is and what the display region's ge geometry is at that moment. Uh, one question we often get is, when should I use the CSS um, APIs or the JavaScript APIs? Uh, now, in some cases, there is no CSS, uh, which can happen when you're working with shapes and objects in Canvas 2D and WebGL. Uh, so if you're building a game, that could leverage both screens on a dual screen device, or if you build out like a sketching app, you'll want to use the JavaScript API to get the geometry of those display regions. Um, another use case would be creating DOM elements at application runtime and appending them to the DOM and inserting some styles inline. In this case, those would probably only be applicable for dual screen. And so let's look at some examples of some enhanced design on, on dual screen devices. Now, our first example is a mail application. Um, and in the example on the left, we see that our layout is just slightly off. 
And due to the nature of the fold on this device, uh, there is some content being obscured by the hinge. So we want to target the design on the right. Like that's our end goal. So how do we get there? So our first media query here is blank because this is where you're going to put your rules that are specific to screens that are wider than a tablet. And then um, our second media feature uh, is for our dual screen device. So we're targeting devices that have a minimum width of 799 pixels and are in the vertical fold posture. So they have those two logical segments of the viewport in the horizontal direction, so they're side by side. Now, our main element here is wrapping the three columns of our email app. So we have the navigation, we have the inbox, and then we have our, our email content. Now, for our navigation in this email app, um, our design specification says that the desired width uh, for this is 60 pixels. And since we're using flex direction row here, flex basis acts like that flex items width. And then for our inbox, um, we want this to consume the entire width of the first display region. So we want to take, our, take up our first viewport minus our navigation width. So we'd have our CSS calculate our width uh, with the viewport segment width environment variable to indicate the entire width of the left display, um, subtract 60 pixels. And then on some devices, um, we have that mask or fold that's covered by part of the device um, hardware. So sometimes we'll need to add a margin after the column, and we could use margin inline end here. And we'll use the calc function to calculate the area that's obscured by the fold, and that identifies that gap. Uh, so we'd subtract the right segment of the left display from the left segment of the right display. And then finally, for our email content, uh, this should just grow to fill up the rest of the space. Uh, so we want that to take up the entirety of our second viewport. And again, we'd use viewport segment width, but with our um, one and zero indices. And so if we look at that example again, uh, that is how we would achieve the layout on the right-hand side with that code and just some flex block. Um, a couple other examples of how to utilize dual screen devices. This is one I commonly see. Um, we have a map application. So you'd have your map on one side, and then if you're searching for something, you'd have your display results take up the entire side of the other viewport. Um, and then this one, this is one of the things that I immediately thought of uh, when I was thinking up ideas for dual screen devices. Um, you'd have a recipe website with your ingredients on one side and then your actual instructions on the other. Um, and I actually got around to building this demo. So if you want to go play with it, um, you can go to aka.ms whack dual dash screen dash demo um, in a Chromium browser um, and open the device emulator in the developer tools um, and select Surface Duo from the dropdown um, to play with that and it, it will appear. Um, it'll adapt to the dual screen emulator and you'll have that layout. And I'm not going to talk through all the code um, for that demo, um, but I do just want to highlight the grid structure here for the, for the main container of the page and the use of the environment variables here. Um, because when I define my grid, um, I'm able to use the environment variable as the value for my first column of my CSS grid structure on a dual screen device. So this line of code is telling the browser, uh, when my device is in that vertical fold position, I want my first column of my CSS grid to take up the entirety of the first viewport. Um, and then for I'll add two other co um, columns with the that are equal width in the remaining space. So that'll take up two columns um, in the second viewport um, for design flexibility. But I love how I can use my um, CSS environment variable to define where my con, like that first grid, uh, that first grid column. And then if for example, I wanted to create a two-column structure in CSS Grid and just have those two columns take up 
um, both viewports. I could use the viewport segment with variables twice, uh, changing their indices to indicate that one column should take up the left viewport and one column should take up the right viewport um, of the device. And so these environment variables like really reduce the friction uh, when it comes to building a layout for dual screen devices. And because of the nature of these variables, um, as foldables and dual screens like start to evolve and we get different uh, sized screens, um, as long as the browsers on those devices support these platform features, the layout will adapt um, and calculate your viewport size. And so you don't need to target like multiple sizes. Like the user agent is going to calculate that for you and sort of adapt your, your design based on that. And that's why I love those environment variables. Um, so let's look at a couple different design pattern do's and don'ts. Um, if you're looking to design something for dual screen, we'll look at two design patterns. Um, we'll look at a two page and extended canvas. There are quite a few more um, in some documentation that I'll link to at the end of this talk. So dual screen can provide like a book-like paging experience, uh, which will allow you to show multiple pages or related groups of information um, that are side by side. And so you want to use those two screens to have two completely separate page views. Um, don't display the page across two screens, having that content pass un under the hinge. And then especially if you have actionable items, Again, split up that content so that each item is on its own display. Uh, and I, once again, like avoiding that hinge. Um, and here you can use like an a illustration or a visual indicator on the second screen if your content only needs one screen. But again, just avoid having that content span those two screens just for the sake of uh, filling up space. Uh, now, the extended canvas pattern is probably the simplest dual screen pattern. Um, and this should be used if your app needs a bigger canvas than just that one viewport. So I mentioned a drawing or sketching app earlier. Um, the extended canvas would be beneficial to your users in that, in that instance. And so if you're using this pattern, um, you want to display any dialogues in the left or right screen, just don't don't center it to the entire device, otherwise it'll fall under that hinge. And then if you have some additional UI that displays information, don't span it across the whole device. Like keep it constrained to one side, and then maybe you can page through content or, or have that scroll down on, on the one viewport. Um, and then the same with, with navigation. Don't span it across, even if it's unobscured. Just keep it to one side. I think the principle of uh, the design principle of proximity probably comes into play here too a little bit. If we want to keep items, um, related items, grouped together, so there's some potential here to confuse users um, if you opt for the design on the right. And again, here, even though we're in a different device orientation, just avoid any toolbars from creeping under that hinge. Um, and again, that's it for the, the design patterns, but there are a couple more um, that you can go check out on the Microsoft Doc site. So I hope you're feeling a little bit inspired um, about what you can do with, with dual screens and how you can adapt your layout. Um, so let's talk about how you can use these um, today. So both um, of these APIs are available in Edge by default um, as of version 97. And they are on by default in Chrome and other Chromium-based browsers. Um, but if you're playing with a demo and it's not working, um, you can go to Chrome uh, flags and enable experimental platform features. And then these. These are available in Edge and Chrome on desktop. So you can play with those in the dual screen emulator and the developer tools. 
Um, so again, if you, if you don't have an actual device, uh, you can use the DevTools emulator in Edge and Chrome. Um, that works on Windows or your Mac. Um, and it'll emulate this device, and it, you can tweak your, just use the dev tools like you normally would um, to tweak your, your layout around. Um, if you don't see a Surface Duo from the device emulator dropdown, uh, go to your dev tool settings, uh, and there should be a spot for enabling dual screen support in your device emulator. Um, so if you need to see how that works, just go to your inspect, find your device emulator, your Surface Duo, and you can change, you can toggle, um, you can toggle the dual screen format on and off, change orientation, so it's all there. And I actually have a Surface Duo that I play with, and I've compared my design to what comes up in the emulator, and it's spot on. Uh, so it does work as a fantastic substitute if you don't have a physical device. Um, so check out our documentation um, for building dual screen. There's some more information um, on things like how to build with React and Xamarin to enhance your apps for dual screens as well. Um, and then if you are a designer, we also have design kits available in Figma for the Surface Duo. And again, you can also find um, the more of those uh, design patterns under that um, user experience page for Surface Duo. So I hope you're as excited um, as I am about these new web features. Um, and if there's anything getting in the way of you starting to experiment uh, with dual screens, dual screens uh, please let us know. You can find us on Twitter at MS Edge Dev or Surface Duo Dev. We're very responsive in answering your questions or getting you any help you need. Um, or you can always drop me a line uh, if you have any questions. I'm C. Otta on Twitter, or you can reach out to my email. Um, and I hope you are excited about the future of web layout. And thank you so much for your time. <laughs>